Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and welcome to another episode of Mineral Talks Live, the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting to you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Swoboda, the president of Blue Cat Productions, and we have a really fun show for you today. For those of you who are tuning into our program for the first time, Mineral Talks Live is a weekly webinar put on by myself representing Blue Cat Productions, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez representing the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayu representing the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. We try to make our program as interactive as possible for you, so let me quickly describe how you can participate in every show. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of buttons. There's one button labeled chat and another labeled Q&A. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. When you first sign on, go ahead and fire off a chat message, introducing yourself and telling us where you're tuning in from. We love to see where our friends are all over the world. Now, during the interview, our guests and I will be focused on our conversation and not looking at the chat window. However, both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments along with everyone else's. At times, either Raquel or Eloise may interject during the interview with questions that you're asking so we can get an immediate answer from our guests while they're still on the topic. Now, the second way to interact is with the Q&A function. This allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interview. So now, on to the show. Our guest today grew up behind the Iron Curtain in Transylvania and spent all of his spare time up in the Carpathian Mountains. He started with volcanology and eventually moved into geology. Now he's the collections manager at the Peabody Museum at Yale University in Connecticut. Please we welcome Stefan Nicolescu. Stefan, how are you, my friend? I'm still upright, so I guess I'm doing <laughs> fine. How are you? <laughs> We're doing fantastic, Stefan. Thanks for joining our show. Thank you especially for jumping in uh, at the last minute. For those who uh, are aware, or even if you're not aware, um, yesterday we got word that our original guest had fallen sick. Uh, as far as I know, she's doing well right now. She's um, uh, hopefully on the road to uh, full recovery. And we contacted Stefan, who was scheduled for a later date, and he was able to switch his schedule and uh, in about 24 hours, uh, you know, agree to come on the show and we did our test and everything. So Stefan, really thank you from the bottom of my heart for being able to just turn like that on a dime and, uh, you know, at the 11th hour notice, come on to the show. It is a privilege and a joy. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Stefan, I know that you are right in the entrance to what is known as the David Friend Hall uh, up at uh, the Perdo, uh, excuse me, up at the Yale uh, Museum, the Peabody Museum. Um, why don't you show us a little bit about where you are and give us a little uh, uh, introduction on the museum? So we are right in front of that uh, beautiful quartz crystal that you just showed. Let me turn the image around. So this is the live view of the. Uh, almost 2,000 pounds uh, heavy uh, Navidian quartz crystal that greets the visitors as they enter the David Friend Hall, or better said, greeted the visitors because the museum is in the process of a, a transformative renovation that will last until 2023. The David Friend Hall came about thanks to the generosity of Yale University 1969 graduate, David Friend. So he helped us, uh, gifted us with the funds to transform what before was our auditorium. And uh, the David Friend Hall actually serves both as an auditorium and as a mineral gallery. So if you See there the empty space in the middle of the gallery. We used to have benches there for the visitors. 
and the benches can be removed and 126 seats can be set up. So we affectionately and jokingly call the gallery sometimes the Minatorium, Mineral <laughs> Gallery Auditorium. So today I am also helped in this task by my colleague, uh, Agnieszka Szielco, she goes by Aggie. And I uh, don't know if you can see her, you see her silhouette there. Yeah. And uh, I also want to mention that I am not the only privileged person to take care of these, of the amazing mineral and meteoritics collections at uh, the Yale Peabody Museum. My direct boss and huge support is Professor Jay Agu, who is a professor in the Yale Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So this beautiful crystal here is also the oldest specimen, geologically speaking, in the collection. It's about 600 million years old. It comes from Ochua mine in Namibia. And the thinking behind the entire gallery here, that was Dave's uh, suggestion, and we found it very, very tempting and, and wonderful, was to display, besides our own specimens, also specimens on loan from world-class collections. So the vast majority by number of the specimens in the David Friend Hall are on loan. And now that the museum is closed, those loans will go back to the lenders. And when we reopen in 2023, we'll have a new set of loan specimens, borrowed specimens. So there is no reason for any of our visitors to say, I'm not coming back because I already saw. No, they didn't see it. We didn't see it yet. So this is a standing invitation to come back after 2023 when we reopen. The big Stephane, specimen, how many pieces are in the David Friend Hall that are owned by the, uh, by the museum or the university? Never asked, uh, never, nobody asked me that question, but it, it's, it's not many. So let me count. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and then the, so about 15, 20 specimens are owned okay. by the Peabody Museum. The vast majority of those are the big specimens, which are also have been acquired uh, thanks to, to Dave's generosity. And also he gifted us a few specimens. So the, the big one there, the sandstone concretion that I will stop by in a few minutes, and this amazing amethyst geode from, from Uruguay. So <clears throat> by volume and mass, we dominate the David Friend Hall, but by no means do we dominate by number or geographical variety of where sure. the specimens come from. So I will focus mainly on uh, these, what we call anchor specimens, so this amethyst here, Aggie is standing next to it. So she'll reach out with her arm so you can see roughly what the size of it is. It's amazing. It has inside, actually you cannot see them unless you pay attention to this column on the right. You might make out under the amethyst coating a few hexagonal prism faces. So that tells us that under that amethyst coating and under the two big uh, calcite crystals, there is another quartz crystal and the same with the amethyst coating on the left. Hmm. So we have actually five generations of mineral formation here. The amethyst that coats the inside of the geode the quartzes that we cannot see, those two columns, then the amethyst that coats that quartz, then the calcite, and you see the black epitaxial overgrowth on the calcite, that's good. Right. So there are five different uh, mineral generations in there. What makes this specimen also very special is that it is open at both ends. So you see now I'm framing the Palm fish yeah, yeah. plate on the other side. 
So that makes it very, very special. And there is an, a story for another day, how I learned about this specimen in Tucson from Dave, uh, friend, I think it was 2015. So another specimen that attracts a lot of attention from our visitors is this sandstone concretion from Fontainebleau in, in France. So it is amazing work of art by mother nature. The Fontainebleau sands are world famous for the purity of the quartz in them. Many of the stained glass windows in European churches and cathedrals have been made from sand from Fontainebleau. Mm. The last claim to world fame of that quartz sand deposit was the 1981 opening of the four pyramids of the Louvre, the glass panes mm. okay. of the pyramids are made from sand from Fontainebleau. Oh. And when the, sun, the sand under certain chemical and mechanical conditions welds uh, itself, so it forms these amazing sandstone concretions. You know, we see those in, uh, at the saint Marie show in France uh, a lot, and they're absolutely wonderful. And it's really nice to actually see these in an American museum. Yes, it's, it, it is a privilege. This is actually a gift from uh, Dave Frank. He acquired it initially, and then he gifted us with it. And, and so, that's an exceptionally large uh, specimen yes. there. And it is very, very clean. So I saw them uh, at uh, Jardin des Plantes in uh, Paris outside, and they're all stained because of the interaction with the, the natural environment. Mm -hmm. And what is really interesting and in a way frightening as well with these very clean ones, the surface is very porous. So mm -hmm. we made a special uh, requirement for when we worked with it for everybody to wear gloves so that uh, human uh, grease from your hands, you know, from our hands doesn't... Uh, infiltrate the, 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 glass, the, the sandstone. Right. Another amazing specimen by its size and its complexity is this huge gypsum desert rose. It's five feet across. It comes from Chihuahua, Mexico. And for me, it is the biggest one that I ever saw this, uh, this size. Actually, it is more like a sandstone because the, gyp oops, the gypsum is sort of cementing sand grains in it. And uh, it's probably something between 50 and 60% sand. Mm. Moving on to another big specimen, actually, now it is the biggest <laughs> and heaviest specimen in our collection. This Thank is you amazing. So, so much, Aggie. It's a Xiefang China fluorite uh, specimen. I don't know if you can call something that big a specimen. It is actually a specimen. Yeah. Uh, coated with quartz and at one and a half metric tons, it is by far the heaviest in the collection. One and a half metric tons is about the weight of my little Nissan Versa notes. So it weighs as much as a small car. Now, Stefan, but, when we look at it like that, we don't have, you know, it looks like maybe just a, a handheld specimen. Could you have Aggie step back in the frame again? because it really is remarkable. It's a beautiful specimen, but then when you get, a, get an idea of the scope of the size of it, it really boggles the mind. And it's, it's one of those things that just grabs your eye because it has this just electric green. The second you walk into the hallway, you see it across the hallway and you just, it, it has to serve as a magnet to so many of the visitors that come visit the, uh, the David Friend Hall. I call it mint jello with icing. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's exactly it. Good God. So from a distance, let's have a look. Oh, it's washed out. It's the, the light is not helpful. Okay, I'll get back to them when I get closer. I wanted to show you the two big aragonites. So from these bigger specimen, both in the collection and in the David Friend Hall, let's move to an amazing display of thumbnails, miniatures, and uh, small cabinet size specimens. So these are 82 specimens, beautiful things that prove the fact that when it comes to minerals, size doesn't matter. <laughs> and a very appropriate description of this display case came from a dad that was visiting the, the gallery with uh, his children. And every now and then we are sneaking into the gallery and eavesdropping on what people say. And when this gentleman walked past this case, he just blurted it out to his kids. Hey, look, baby minerals. And that's what they are. <laughs> they, they indeed are. Yeah. Have yet to grow into big crystals like the fluorite you just shared with us. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Some crystals continue growing, some don't. Well, obviously not in a, in a museum setting. Right. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is that we just recently finished a project uh, of 3D, 360 degrees photographing every single one of these 82 specimens. And we have started releasing the images one, one at a time every week. So if you go to peabody.yale.edu and uh, look for, for uh, our Peabody at Home page, at the bottom of the page is a link that will allow you to see the first, I think, 10 specimens that we already posted there. And you can ma manipulate the images Zoom in, zoom out, control rotation, tilt. It's, it's really something. Now, Stefan, I'm going to switch over uh, on my camera here. This is a live view of the website. Um, and the direct URL is collections.peabody.yale.edu slash, oh, this is too hard. I think the, you know, your way of finding it is better. Uh, look for it on the Peabody homepage, but here's what it looks like and you can scroll down and uh, You have uh, the first 10 that are up right now and For this example if we click on wolfenite here Click that center button it will load and then this runs just as a, uh, a standard uh, kind of animated GIF if you will, it's a bunch of still images but once you interact with it, it will stop and as I slide my finger to the left, it rotates to the left. And as I slide my finger to the right, it rotates to the right. And obviously this happens with a, a mouse as well. I just happen to be using an iPad here. And then at any point I can slide my finger up. And I think there are one, two, three, there are four different four. angles yep. of view that you can fully rotate it again. And Stefan, I know that you were, you have been very, uh, involved in the pioneering of this kind of recording of images for the public to see. Yes, but I was... Can I intervene for a few seconds here? Yes. If you don't mind. Um, can you try to put um, Stefan's video as a highlight? Because it looks like when we're putting it as a highlight, a lot of people continue showing, uh, seeing the four split screens instead of the main video. So there might be something uh, wrong with... Um, uh, with her viewing today for whatever reason. So were you able to highlight Stefan's video or just to see if it works from you because you are the main host tonight? Uh, let's see if I can, how's can that? Go to the, um, so I just pinned, I pinned my Not screen. Again, Is that what we're talking about? To, no, it's, I think it's highlights. Uh, you have to go to the more option on, the, on the Stefan's uh, name. Uh, I will try again and then we'll see if people actually can see um, Stefan's video better now. Sorry, yeah. It's okay, we'll figure it out. We're trying a few things. Sorry to interrupt, guys. 
Oh, no, okay. no. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, just for fun, I'm going to switch out from the uh, wolfenite and let's go take a look at this fluorite since uh, we're in kind of fluorite mode. And so it loads very quickly. And I can't imagine how many photos, but you have to take 360 degree photos of this thing four different times because you have four different yep. elevations. Yep. And then it's given you this ability to just really yeah. look at it in a right. way that zoom we haven't seen well, before. Because you can zoom in quite a bit. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. And give it a few seconds so that it uh, clears out. It, look at that. It, yep. Yeah. All right. And I, you know, I think the interface is a little bit weird on an iPad because right be. now it's all highlighted, but I'm sure it works better if we use um, just a normal uh, web browser that's not uh, touch enabled like this. Um, so those thumbnails, they're on loan. Are they going to remain in the museum when no. you reopen? No, they are going back uh, to, to the lenders mm -hmm. and uh, we'll figure out something else. <laughs> well, I hope you continue to get uh, thumbnails uh, either from another set of thumbnails from the same lender or um, from some other uh, thumbnail collectors because I think it's very important to uh, talk about thumbnail, continue talking about thumbnail collection as a, as a genre, if you will. Yeah, um, it's generally where you find the most perfection in mineral crystals because the smaller they are, the better the chance of them growing more perfectly without damage. And yep. I think over the past years, we've seen incredible thumbnail displays at the Munich show in recent years that just kind of grab the European audience by storm. And it's just really focusing on those thumbnails are incredible. We've got a group of young mineral collectors um, there was uh, Kyle Kevorkian, uh, Will Larson, and uh, uh, Rika Larson, who put in a case of just thumbnails at uh, this year's Tucson show. It's really, it's a, it's a wonderful category and just incredibly beautiful. And I'd love to see a continued exhibit there at the Peabody. Yeah, Will and Rika were here just before the pandemic hit us. So they saw it in the flash. Okay, great. So... And one more thing, Brian, if you don't mind, at the end of the, um, of the interview, could you just send the link in the chat room because uh, it's not easy to find for us. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we, I've unpinned my video. Um, Eloise, can we uh, go back to uh, Stefan's video so that we can see what he's showing us now? There we go. Okay. Stefan, please continue. So this is a historical specimen that came out of the famous Branchville quarry, the Philo quarry in Branchville here in Connecticut, about 20 miles west of New Haven in the 1870s when E.S. Dana, J.D. Dana's son and George Jarvis Brush were working the quarry and they described nine new mineral species from the quarry. When we go down into the collection, I will show you a few of the type specimens, so to speak. There wasn't the concept of type specimen back in the 1870s. So this is a specimen of Muscovite on albite. And this is a rather unusual morphology for Muscovite. It is uh, hemispherical. It's called ball peen Muscovite. Like the hammer. And Yep, exactly. And it has this unusual sheen. It looks almost like, in my mind, like a reptile skin or something like that. Certainly. It's beautiful, yeah. it's historical in many respects, and it, is, it has a beauty of its own. So just briefly, we are kind of running short of time, we should move down to the, to the collection soon. So this is an aragonite from uh, China. And unfortunately, due to its fragility, we couldn't mount it the way it was in the mine working where it came from. You see that uh, column on the left pointing mm -hmm. up? That's actually a stalactite, so it should point down. 
Oh, but so it's we, actually upside down as displayed. Yeah, yeah, but we cannot put it upside down because it is so fragile that we would ruin the specimen. So I make a note whenever I give a tour, uh, pointing it out to, to our visitors that uh, due to its fragility and its beauty, we have to, to display it this way. And now, do you see parents holding their kids upside down so that the kids can see it properly? No, but I can suggest that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I like the way you think, Brian. Oh, cool. You know, I was thinking on the feet. <laughs> so this is another aragonite from, uh, from China. Aggie, move in a little bit more. So there you see Aggie for scale. And many people call these frozen fireworks. I like to call it Elgin marbles made in China. It reminds me somehow of the friezes of the Parthenon in Athens, or actually uh, more like the friezes of the Parth Parthenon at the British Museum in London. That so is the last stop here in the David Trent Hall it will be here at our gem case. And because the light is so harsh here, and the quality of the image on the iPad is not that great. Uh, Brian will uh, pull up some photographs that I sent him so that uh, you can see these pieces of jewelry in their uh, entire beauty. Okay, I've got the, uh, the image up on my screen. So if uh, Raquel or Eloise can spotlight my video, so then... Brian, we have a little issue with you on video, so I switch it off, and that's when people were able to see. So can you switch on your video again? Can uh, you try? Yes. Oh, if you make me host back, maybe we can deal with it from the back. Thank there you. There we yeah, go. Yeah, that's working. Okay. Perfect. So yes, this is better. So the top one is a Golconda diamond. Uh, below it, we're going to zoom in on that one. Yep. Below and what's the carat weight of that main stone? It's 9.07 uh, carats. And then okay. below it is a yellow diamond from uh, South Africa. Now that is 7.05 carats. And this fluoresces beautifully in, in uh, UV or even in, in, in blue light. And then I think I hear Eloise dro drooling. She loves colored diamonds. <laughs> I know she did some awesome work on, on colored diamonds when she was at the Smithsonian. And uh, then uh, let's move to the opals, uh, Brian. So this is a Windsor uh, ruby from Tanzania, uh, a Sri Lankan sapphire. This is almost as big as Lady Di's uh, engagement ring. It's 10.8. 08 carats sapphire. Yeah, the color on that is just superb. Yeah. And this is a Colombian emerald. And then we have a range of uh, opals. So many of the rings that you saw up there, most of them were actually made by Richard Wise in uh, Lenox, Massachusetts. All these specimens, all, all these objects, all these beautiful pieces of jewelry are part of uh, a bequest that we received from uh, a person, a very generous person in, in Massachusetts, Cora Miller. And these, what we see now, these were made by Paula Crevoche and uh, Cora Miller purchased from Paula as well. As well. So earrings, and the next one is a black opal pendant uh, on a necklace and another pair of black opal earrings. And then we have in the case also objects on loan like this crazy 45 carat Burmese sapphire in a platinum uh, necklace with diamonds. And uh, as I was telling uh, Brian yesterday, I know that many might think Lucy in the sky with di diamonds, but uh, this one is Sapphire in platinum with diamonds. And then Stefan, the, the ring was also a Burmese sapphire. 
The ring was Sri Lanka, Sifa. Sri Lanka, Sifa. thank you. And this one is Myanmar or, or Burma. And then we have an amazing necklace with, pair, with uh, matching earrings, also Burmese uh, rubies in uh, a platinum necklace with, with diamonds. So with this, I think we have to start moving towards the collection. So... Now, Stefan, while you're walking, uh, maybe you could talk real quickly about the philosophy that David Friend had in putting in such large uh, specimens, mineral specimens, uh, in his hall. So, I don't know exactly uh, why, but I can see the beauty of them, you know. Okay. They, are, they are absolutely amazing, and it's very hard, I think, to come by of really aesthetic large specimens. As you pointed out, smaller specimens tend to be less uh, imperfect, but when you find something like even the, the gypsum uh, desert rose uh, mm -hmm. of that perfection, it is fascinating. The funny thing with the gypsum desert rose was that when we uncreated it down in the basement when it arrived, one of our colleagues, a paleontologist, he described it as Stegosaurus roadkill, <laughs> which is kind of appropriate. Right. So I don't know if you have live image here uh, as I walk by. If you. Sounds like we lost audio on Stefan. Yeah, right I don't now. know why. I, I think okay. you're back. I mean, right. I think I'm back. I saw it. Let's went switch. Off, to, there we go. Okay. So. These are the gutted galleries because we are getting ready for, for, for uh, renovation. And I will tell you a few things about the renovation as well a little bit in a few minutes. But let's do a little bit of history of the, of the mineralogy collection and the Peabody uh, Museum. So the mineralogy collection was started by Benjamin Sillum, father, when he became the ninth professor at Yale and the first professor of science. And he was instrumental in acquiring amazing collections. He was instrumental in many respects. So this is Benjamin Silliman at the age of 46. I think we, we lost Yes, Stefan that's, that's we what, usually when we lose him. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just so that everybody knows what's happening is Stefan's moving. The uh, David Friend Hall is up on the third floor of the museum and he's now going down the stairwell because, uh, and he's gonna show us some of the uh, renovations that are happening right now. And, and, and keep in mind that David Friend Hall only opened uh, four years ago, it was 2016. And uh, so already they're doing some major renovations and I wasn't sure the scope of the renovations until uh, Stefan showed us yesterday what they're doing and it's amazing they're re they're creating a whole new building it's really going to be fantastic so <clears throat> we wanted to get stuff on on the sh on the show as quickly as possible because very soon they're going to close the museum and we thought it was uh, very important to include the peabody in our our series of shows. So Stefan's going downstairs right now and he's going to show us some of the um, uh, the plans of what they're developing and then we're going to go down into the heart of um, the the Peabody Mineral Lab um, where they keep all the uh, all the pieces where they store everything as you've seen before with many of our curator interviews. So uh, we're going to go and we're going to check uh, check that out and so we're going to see some exciting things. Stay with us. Um, as he was talking about, this is uh, Silliman, and he was responsible for uh, really playing an important part in the uh, start of the, uh, uh, the museum. Now, I'm looking at Stefan's camera, and it looks like we've got a video, but I don't think we have audio. Stefan, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, yeah, we got you back. Okay. Great. Then I go just back just a little bit. So just a quick stop here. Pardon the dust, everything is moving away. So this wing of the Peabody was the uh, administrative 
uh, wing, and these will become exhibit space. We'll gain over 50% more exhibit space after the renovation. So what you see here, this is the building of the Peabody Museum. This is the second Peabody Museum. We, we are in, in this wing. And what you see here, this part, this is an empty plot now. We'll have a new four floor tall building with the city space, the classroom, with the Stefan, I think we lost your audio, but what he's saying is that part, the, the U-shaped building that was in the, on the left side of that, kind of the upper left, that's a whole new building that's being built. Right now, it's just a, a, an empty lot. And the original, um, you saw, do we have you back, Stefan? I, I hear you. I don't know if you can see me. So yeah, this is the original yeah. 1926 building, which is the current building. And then this is interesting because this is the interior of the old mineral hall. And this was very interesting because I just learned this today, uh, Stefan and I were talking this morning. If we zoom in here, that door that you see on the right is actually in the back of the uh, David Friend uh, mineral hall. And kind of the view that we're seeing right now is what the David Friend Mineral Hall, uh, or that is the location of where the David Friend Mineral Hall is now located. So over the years, obviously these cases have been, been, been brought out. This is what the museum looked like when Bob Jones uh, first started visiting the Peabody and his visits there uh, really affected him and got him into mineral collecting. And I think the entire community has benefited from that just uh, from all the knowledge that he shared from the countless thousands of articles he's written for uh, um, for the magazines and for the co-hosting that he's done on many of the What's Hot shows. Uh, so let's go back to Stefan. I think, are we, Do you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. We're about to go in into uh, your laboratory, if you will. Yeah, it's a multi-purpose room. <laughs> it's a lab, it's an office, it's a uh, collection storage. It's a wonderful place to be in. If it would have windows as well, I wouldn't have any more requirements for that room. It has no windows. Stefan, while you keep walking, you think you could tell us a bit about the history of the Yale Peabody? Oh, the Yale Peabody Museum was uh, started, established in 1866 with a gift from George Peabody, who had uh, his nephew, Otniel Charles Marsh, as a student at the Yale College, as it was then. Benjamin Silliman developed an amazing skill at teaching, although by training he was a lawyer, and uh, many bright young people came to Yale to learn either from Silliman directly, like James Dwight Dana was a Silliman student and a Silliman assistant, the first Silliman professor at Yale, and also Benjamin Silliman's son-in-law. And Otniel Charles Marsh came to Yale after Silliman retired. So this is Marsh at a young age. He was financed for his studies by his uncle, George Peabody. And uh, Marsh became the first paleontologist in the United States. Uh, he made the Peabody Museum world famous with the amazing fossil discoveries from the West that was still wild at that time. So the first claim to fame for the Peabody Museum was the Great Hall of Dinosaurs. So and there is, I, I can go on and on and on, but uh, <laughs> uh, that has to wait for another day. So if you can put me back uh, on, on live broadcast. So what I'm showing you there in the back in the show and tell gallery here in the collection room, you might be able to make out B. Silliman on that label. Mm. That's something that we consider as being specimen number one. So that was acquired by Benjamin Silliman in 1805 when he was 
in Great Britain from a German chemist living at the time in London by the name Frederick Ackerman. So Silliman wrote, wrote on it, B. Silliman from F. Ackerman, London, 1805. The specimen, it's not much, it's a hematite uh, from, from England, but what makes it special is that label that it is still preserved on it. Another specimen that we know for sure it was in Benjamin Silliman's hands is this still bite from Connecticut. And if you look on the lower side of the specimen, you see two black letters, BS. And as I tell high schoolers when they visit, it doesn't stand for what you think it stands for. It stands for- Well, oh, it's my Silliman. initials. That must be my specimen. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> when, when did you collect it? A long time ago, you know, it's, it, 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 memory fades, you know how it is. Yeah, so this is basically our show and tell case. Uh, this is the, the, the calcite there in the back. That's a historic specimen as well, but I'm not going to go into that just yet. What I want to show you. Stefan, I think we lost your audio there. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, now we can hear you, yes. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, so what are you looking at? Oh, it's, it's reflection from, from the lights, maybe like this. So what you're looking at there is James Dwight Dana's hammer and his compass and compass case. Wow. We also have the first edition of a system of mineralogy, 1837. Moreover, this is Dana's personal copy. No kidding. Well, these things were in Tucson, I think three years ago. Okay. No, more like four. We also have the contact goniometer, Dana's contact goniometer. You can barely make out his name there on the case. But not only that it was Dana's, is one of the four full circle Linke contact goniometers in existence. So this is one. This one belonged to George Jarvis Brush. So this is two. And this is also signed by Linke. And the other two, one is at the Berg Academy in Freiburg and the other one, the fourth one, in the personal collection of Olaf Madden. Actually, so, Olaf, I, think, I think you might have been covering the microphone with your hand. So I heard that the third one's at the Freiburg Museum in Germany. And where's the fourth one? Olaf Maddenbach personal collection. Actually, it was okay. Olaf that alerted me to the very unique uh, the character of these two contact goniometers. So wonderful. Let's go into the storage space now. Pardon the dust. Uh, I am actively rehousing the specimen the specimen that specimens that came off display. So what how I many pulled, specimens are in the Yale collection? Well, we are a small collection compared to big museums like uh, Harvard or Smithsonian. So we have about 40,000 mineral specimens, about 1,500 meteorite specimens, and over 100,000 rock specimens. Oh, so it's small. <laughs> yeah. Well, everything in life is a question of reference system, right? Sure. <laughs> so what I pulled out here is one of the first collections that Silliman uh, got first on display and then purchased from the owner of the collection. This is an 18th century French mineral collection. These are the leftovers, about 200 specimens found so far. And uh, the labels on the specimens and the ink and the glue are 18th century. And alchemical symbols were used for the elements. So you see there the moon for mm -hmm. silver, you see there the sun for uh, gold. And many of these specimens, the first page 
in the original catalog of the collection, which we have, it starts with gold, native gold, and uh, the entire first page is Transylvania, Transylvania, Transylvania. That warms my little Transylvanian heart. And we still have some of those specimens. Also, I know I always get so excited when I see the gold from Transylvania and the What's Hot programs. They are fantastic and they are very rare. So as soon as yes. I see them, they're usually grabbed up. I mean, very historic minerals. So also in 1781, as you can see here, so 1881. Why is that so blurry? I don't know. Uh, these book, Histoire Naturelle ou Exposition Générale, so Natural History or uh, General Presentation, a part one, The Mineral Kingdom, started being published. And uh, specimens from the Gigot d'Orsay collection were featured in the publication. So here you see the image, here you see the specimen. Oh, fantastic. It's top, topaz from Schneckenstein. Here is another one. This is uh, an emerald with a little bit of artistic license from <laughs> Colombia. And here is the specimen. Next. Oh, one. great. Great. Stefan, could you move a little farther? Maybe that will help with the focus. I think that it, might. Okay. Think it, yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. No, 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 it's just trying. <laughs> you, you realize what a good cameraman I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we cannot be perfect on everything. You're an amazing curator. So, what I pulled out here oh are God. two specimens that just came out of the, the uh, display. So, Aggie, can you put your arm next to that stim knight? So that's a 59 centimeter tall Ichinokawa steam knight. And next to it is another sort of sandstone if we were to, to demote it. So it's actually it's like a, a sand, ca sand calcite from Fontainebleau. So Fontainebleau has the Michelin guide guy sort of uh, sandstone. And then it has these crazy, uh, calcite cementing sand by and also preserving the rhombohedral shape of the calcites. That's wonderful. I didn't know that was also from Fontainebleau. Yep. Uh, and that stib knight is incredible. Those are the Japanese stib knights. Yes. We're seeing the Chinese ones, but to see a Japanese one so big and it looks just perfect, no imperfections on it. Obviously, you can't tell from the video, but it just looks fantastic. What a what a great, great piece. So speaking of great pieces, let's move a little bit into the cabinets. So here. Excuse me, Stefan, I'm going to ask uh, Raquel and or Eloise to go ahead and launch the uh, the poll that we have today. And if you see that pop up on your screen, you can just uh, uh, close that so that uh, it doesn't okay. block your view. Okay. Okay. So this is a Kellymine Smithsonite. Whoa. My finger for, for scale. And you see the white spots? That's calcite. So this Smithsonite didn't need any cleaning when it came out of the ground. Below it, a Copper Queen mine, Come on. Malachite. Uh, uh, Azurite, again for scale. And this was a gift from James Douglas, the president, the first president of Phelps Dodge. He sent lots of specimens to Yale. And then here, a copper from Houghton County, County in, in, in Michigan with beautiful copper crystals. I cannot go too close because then we lose the sharpness of, of, of the image. That's a great piece. 
So now, going back in time, I do have to say a few words about meteorites. And I pulled out here a few of our signature meteorites. As I said, we have about 1,500 in the collection, and the collection is growing. So this meteorite here, this is the Western meteorite that fell on December 14th, uh, 1807. Benjamin Suleiman analyzed it and uh, published it. This is the first witnessed meteorite fall in the New World. And it's basically the beginning of the science of meteoritics in North America. And I like to call it also the embryo of the Yale Peabody Museum. And the papers that were published are the birth certificate of the Yale Peabody Museum because Silliman established his reputation worldwide and in America as a scientist, as an educator. And that's how Dana and Marsh and many other bright young men came to study at Yale. But we can go even further back in time to the beginning of the solar system. So I pulled out here two specimens. This one is Allende that fell in 1969. And this one is Murchison that fell also in 1969. These are both witnessed falls. And it turns out that 1969 was a good year in many respects. Not only the day friend graduated Yale College in 1969, these two amazing meteorites fell, and also a small event, a musical event in upstate New York happened in the same year, 1969, <laughs> at Woodstock. And the first man stepped on the moon in 1969 as well. Now, why are these meteorites so important? So Murchison, which, Egg, can you? Yeah, just train on me. I don't want to touch it with bare hands because this is one of the very special meteorites. So Murchison is very rich in carbon and it has over 70 amino acids in it. It also has protoplanetary, uh, pre-solar uh, particles. Uh, polymorphs of carbon, diamond, and so on. So this is very, very critical in understanding our place in the solar system. Same thing with Allende. So what you see the white spots there where the fusion crust was removed are so-called calcium aluminum inclusions or ties. Those are the oldest objects in the solar system. They have been dated at 4.567 billion with a B years old. And meteorites of this kind are basically left leftovers from- oh, Stefan, we lost your video for a sec. Did you- I know because I am low on battery. Uh -oh. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to plug in my charger. So I hope- That's why we love live video. Yeah. So this keeps us on our toes. There we is go. Is it back? You're okay. Back. Yeah. So what I was saying is that meteorites are leftovers from the formation of the solar system. It is the same material in the meteorites as it was in the protoplanetary disk. And wow. I like to use the analogy with chocolate chip cookies. So <laughs> chocolate chip cookies are flour, sugar, milk, butter, whatever. I know how to eat them. I don't know how to make them. <laughs> and by exposing that mixture to time and temperature in the oven, they change into chocolate chip cookies. Well, guess what? What we are looking at here are also the basic ingredients of everything in the solar system, from the sun to the Kuiper world, us included. So remember, we are the chocolate chip cookies of the solar system. It only took time and transformation to go from what we look at here to what we are today. You know, I so, love that analogy. It's, it's so, it really is humbling. Um, and it's, uh, it's incredible to be able to look at the raw elements there that created everything. Yep. So this piece of rust here is another very important meteorite. It is the Krasnoyarsk that was 
discovered by locals in Siberia in 1749. And Peter Simon Pallas, that was traveling through Siberia in the 1770s at the invitation of uh, uh, <clears throat> Catherine the Great, who was of German origin. They found the meteorite. They didn't know what it was. They took it back to St. Petersburg. And then in 1794, uh, Florian Kladny, a German scientist, put forward the theory for him, it was just a hypothesis for others, that this is actually an extraterrestrial object. And he was derided until about 1802, when the scientists in France and Britain came to the same conclusion with other uh, objects that had no uh, equivalent on the earth. And what I pulled out here is also this little stone that you cannot really see, but Brian will pull up a photograph that I sent him about this. Brian, can you pull it? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So that is a cut olive from the Krasnoyarsk meteorite. It is a palisite. The meteorite is a palisite. That means that it has olive. So that little stone there is literally a gem out of this world in spite of its tiny size. Another one that I want to show you is this one. It's Wethersfield that fell in Connecticut in 1982 and went through the roof of a house. And I need just a second. I, 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 am, I have umbilical cords. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this is a photograph of the fire brigade chief that was called into the house up there to the left you see the hole in the ceiling that's where the meteorite came through it was in the evening and the homeowners saw something that they thought was uh, smoke in the house it was actually pulverized sheet rock so because they thought it's smoke they called the fire department in they came in and one of the firefighters saw this piece that you're looking at now, it's about the size it. of a big gra grapefruit under the dining table. <laughs> I said, well, it's not fire, it's a meteorite. He, he was well trained in, in meteoritics. He recognized it for it, what it was. And the Peabody Museum was fortunate enough to be able to acquire it. The last- I absolutely love it. The last, uh, God. Oh, we lost your video again, Stefan. I know because I unplugged accidentally. Oh. I unplugged my okay. my uh, uh, iPad. So the last piece I want to show you is this little insignificant looking thing. So this is a fragment of the Walcott meteorite that fell in 2013 with a little bit of the fusion crust. Uh, mm -hmm. It also hit a house. I'm not going to go into details. There is an entire story about this. It's really funny. I just want to say that I analyzed and classified this meteorite. And now Yale Peabody Museum and the Yale University is one of 104 institutions worldwide accredited as type meteorite specimen repositories because of this little piece. Fantastic. So, Stefan, I think we're just scratching the surface of what you have there at the, uh, at the Peabody Museum at Yale University. Uh, we're coming to the end of our show. So what I'm going to ask is uh, if we can close the poll. I've got five questions that I'm going to ask you, Stefan. And we're going to see if the viewers can guess the answers that you're going to give to these five questions. OK, yeah, I know the spiel. You know the spiel. OK, let's but turn on your camera. Um, Face while we're doing it? Can yeah, of course. Well, Stefan, don't let's look see at your... Now, look let's at see those beautiful eyes of yours. L look at specimens. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> that is an okay, Arispe we'll, Stefanite. We'll just pretend that's you. <laughs> well, it's Stefanite, just that it is misspelled. It's misspelled with a PH. Perfect. So they should change Perfect. the spelling to F. Okay. So All right. Let's go on these questions. Way. So, uh, Stefan, you know the spiel. 
There are five questions. You respond just as quickly as you can, okay? Yes. Okay, so number one, backpacking in the mountains or far, far, far niente by, by the pool? Backpacking. Backpacking, okay. Volcano or hot springs? That's a tough one because hot springs are related to volcanoes, but I think volcanoes are more spectacular volcanoes. Okay. Best monster, Frankenstein's creature or Dracula? <laughs> well, I love Mary Shelley, so Frankenstein. <laughs> I thought you were going to, okay. Garnet or diamond? Tough, because both of them are absolutely amazing in terms of the information that you can read out of them. Garnet. Garnet. Final question. If you were to do a spacewalk, would it be on the moon or on Mars? On Mars, because it hasn't been walked on yet. Uh -huh, there we go. Okay. Let's go to the poll and let's see how our viewers have responded. Uh, Eloise or Raquel, do we have the answers that you can read off? Yes, we do. No, number one, backpacking in the mountains or farniente by a pool? Do you know how to pronounce farniente, uh, Brian? Obviously not. <laughs> Dolce farniente. Farniente. <laughs> okay, so the people that got the right answer, backpacking in the mountains. Backpacking. Volcano or hot springs? Volcano. Did I pronounce that okay? <laughs> From a French woman, like that's going crazy. I know. Okay, moving on. Best monster, Frankenstein's creature or Dracula? Okay, people thought Dracula, so that's wrong. Yeah, I would have. I would have gone Dracula because Transylvania. Come on. Yeah. Uh, number four, garnet or diamond? People got it right. Garnet. Garnet. Fantastic. Yeah, and didn't tell us everything about. Uh, the subject of uh, study, but uh, that's, that's going to be for another day. Again, we could probably go another hour. Easy. No problem. Final question. Spacewalk. On the moon or on Mars? People got it wrong. They guessed on the moon. They guessed on the moon. Well, the poll is wrong because it says moon, moon twice. It doesn't say Mars. <laughs> yes, oh, really? I know. Yes. I, oh, <laughs> that was okay. my mistake. I was In not that case, that was, uh, that was Raquel's bad. She owes... <laughs> She, she owes us a drink, Stefan. Yeah, definitely. I prefer okay, Slivovic. So we're going to say everybody's a champion. Um, because of the last minute uh, nature of this thing, we haven't had time to put together any kind of prize, but we'll figure something out. Um, let's go now to the Q&A. Are there questions? We're a little bit over one hour mark, but maybe there's some questions that the uh, viewers have that we can ask of Stefan. Yes, we do, especially for meteorite. Uh, Stefan, does the P Valley still have the one 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 thousand eight hundred zero three Western CD meteorite collected by Dr. Silliman? So the Western meteorite was collected by well, no, the Western meteorite that we have, he couldn't get when he was out in the field in December eighteen oh seven, but. The meteorite, the western that you saw now, was purchased by George Gibbs III, who had an amazing mineral collection, including the French collection that I showed you a snippet of. And when mm -hmm. Gibbs sold his collection to the Peabody, to the Yale College in 1805, uh, sorry, 1825, then this piece of western that Silliman wanted but couldn't acquire came to the Yale College and then in 1866 to Yale Peabody Museum. Did do I answer the, the question? Yes, and do you have the main mass? According to the meteoritic bulletin, they should be 150 kilos, but your museum is located as the one with the main mass. Well, it could be 150 kilos because there were many pieces and Silliman gave uh, many of them away at the uh, at will, he gifted many people with pieces of, of the uh, Western meteorite. But what you see here is the biggest mass 
still in existence today. So in a way, it is the main mass, but it, it, this was not a single meteorite. It, meteorites, when they fall, they many times create what is called a strewn field. It's an elliptical surface on which the different pieces scatter, especially if fragmentation happens in the atmosphere. And there were at least six big spots where the meteorite fragments fell. So it wasn't 150 kilograms in one piece. It was, it was reconstructed now to 150 kilograms by adding up the different pieces that are known to still be in existence today. Great. We have another question from Maria. Uh, you decide to acquire a meteorite from the fire station or the owners of the house? So the meteorite, <laughs> so this is the rule. With meteorites, finders, keepers. So the finders, in this case, it's a little bit dicey. <laughs> the finder was the fire uh, man that found it, but it was on the property of the homeowners. And they became the owners of Weathersfield, which you see there behind Weston. And uh, they had the meteorite and they were generous enough to donate it eventually to the Peabody Museum. Okay. We have someone very interested in the Brist Bristol Copper Mine collection. I know. I wanted <laughs> to show. So I didn't get everywhere where I wanted to get. So I wanted to get to that stephanite, to the Bristol uh, mine, to the type specimens that we have. Let's see if we can make it to Bristol now. So can you pull that uh, again? Uh, pull the ladder out. out. That's good enough. And then make sure I have juice. Okay. So I'm moving into the stacks. That's it? This is the okay, good. I don't need more. We are here. <laughs> so Line storage. I like it. <laughs> so Bristol. Uh, am I in the wrong drawer? Yes, I am. So Bristol is famous for both calcocyte and for uh, bornite. So am I on? Yes. yes. So this is, <laughs> what's so funny, Brian? Oh, uh, just, no, it's Raquel's reaction. This is a Bristol calcocyte again, that just came off display. Wow. And this is one of the few that doesn't have jewelite on it, the suit. So here are other beautiful Bristol crystals, but they are all covered in suit. You see my finger? Oh, so yeah. that's jewelite that comes off. And then here is a beautiful one. I really like this. In general, I prefer specimens on matrix because mm. that tells me the environment in which the mineral formed by the way, by, by training, I'm an ore deposit geochemist. And the Bristol calcocytes were the first ones recognized back in the 1920s by Alan Bateman, who was a professor of economic geology here at Yale, uh, as being hypogenic in genesis. So formed directly and not as a secondary alteration copper mineral. So these are important, not only aesthetically, but also uh, scientifically. And then another mineral species that Bristol is famous for is born, uh, bornite. So where is my bornite? Uh, here it is. So these are some beautiful bornite crystals right. from Bristol. Uh, again, this just came down from, from the permanent display that we had. So, and then there are other bornite crystals here. By the way, these little wooden stands to which the specimens are attached with beeswax, these are from back the uh, 1800s. So this is how they were mounting small specimens back in the day. Here is another one. So 
yeah, it would be wonderful to have more time to talk about Bristol and what it meant in the history of mining and mineralogy, but I think that will be again something for another day. <laughs> Stefan, I have one last question for the, the new Minera Museum for the renovation of the gallery. Do you have a, a plan? It seems like you're going to keep the same space. So do you have a plan for how it's going to be lay the layout of the new exhibit? Yes, yes. So first of all, the David Friend Hall will stay almost unchanged, although we are adding a new room uh, next to it. So we'll need to cut some doors in the walls in the David Friend Hall, but that will stay somewhat unchanged. We have a new space about 500 square feet, not big, very big, but there is a new space for, for mineral displays. And then in the gutted part of the display space that I walked through when I came out of the David Friend Hall, there will be cases there as well. And the meteorites will go back part of them and, and so on. Actually, I have a meeting this afternoon talking about the, the new plans for, for the museum. Thank you. I think that's all, Brian. All right. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for your time and sharing uh, your passion. Uh, I think anyone can see you're 100% passionate about your job. There's so much more that we could talk about, but uh, really, uh, the Peabody Museum is a real institution for our country. And we really thank you for this opportunity to go into the museum with you for our private tour. I have to thank you for the chance of scraping the surface of this absolutely amazing collection. Small. Can you see your face before you leave, Stefan? Can you switch the camera well <laughs> now so that we can actually see you? One well, last time. You... Thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Let's hope yeah. for times when we won't have to be masked when we are more than one person in a room. Absolutely. And I also want to, to thank Agi for, for, for her help today. So yeah. where is that? Oh, wait, I have to switch. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Where's Agi? There is Agi. Thank, thank you, guys. you. Thank you. Excellent job. Well, Stefan, we look forward to uh, the reopening of the Peabody and uh, hopefully we'll have a big party and all of us can come out and join you in person and then we can spend a couple days wandering around the museum. So uh, we're looking forward I, to that. I'm building the VIP list so you are already on it and everybody Woo! is welcome to the VIPs. <laughs> all right. Well, for everyone out there watching, we want to thank you sincerely for joining us today and for sticking with us uh, for the show. Uh, despite some of the technical problems, I think we had a wonderful show. Again, really want to stay, uh, thanks Stefan for uh, taking the time out. Um, tomorrow, we will be launching on YouTube episode 14. That was the episode we filmed with Dr. George Rossman from uh, the California Institute of Technology. So that originally aired on September 2nd. It will go live uh, tomorrow. So keep an eye out on that. We'll make our announcements online. Also, Join us next week. We're going to have Sammy Mackey from Matrix India Minerals out of Pune, India. He's going to be joining us. So he's going to be broadcasting straight from India, which uh, time zone kind of, I don't know what the time zone is there, but uh, he said he's cool with it. It's going to be 1030 at night for him. Yes. Okay. Terrific. Great. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Everybody knows Sammy. He's a great guy. He's been on What's Hot a lot of times and always has some great stuff and they're active right now. So we get to see some new stuff that's uh, coming out of ground. So again, thank you for, uh, thank you to Stefan and Agi and thanks to the Peabody Museum and to all of you viewers, thanks for watching. Aloha, take care, bye. Thank you, take care, see you soon.